welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys have all been doing well. I have returned to the whiteboard. We got a new one, so hopefully this one lasts longer than the last one. Uh, as you can see, we're going to review some vision-based terms. This is definitely not all of them. There are so many. So I'm going to start here and hopefully work on ocular motor function as well as some other vision related tests that I can review down the line. But I think this is a good place to start if you want to do a nice review on vision and what OTs address specifically within visual impairments and deficits. Before we get started, I want to clarify that OTs do not address visual acuity. As many of you know, visual acuity has to do with the clarity of our vision. So when we go to the eye doctor and they make us read off those rows of letters from a far, you know, far away, that's them testing our visual acuity. And so that's looking at like the sharpness of our retinal focus and of course like the health of our eyes. They take care of all of that. That is not in OT's realm but there are plenty of visual deficits that come with injuries, strokes, car accidents that we address to support them work through their daily living skills, driving, and everything that we need to do on a daily basis since vision is a crucial part of our lives. So let's get started on the top left corner with hyperopia versus myopia. Now this is where I made a change. If you guys watch this video for the first upload, this is where I would like you to make an update because I added a differentiation between hyperopia and presbyopia. So hyperopia is farsightedness and this is due to an irregular eye shape. And so that means that close objects tend to be blurry, but far away objects will look okay. The opposite of that is myopia, and this is nearsightedness. This is what I have. So this is due to your eyeball being too long. So you notice here that hyperopia and myopia both have to do with the shape of your eyes. So this one means that close objects will appear clear, but far away objects will look blurry. And when I looked up myopia, it also was talking about how nearsightedness can also mean that you lack like creativity or intellect in a different um, definition. So that is helpful for me to think of my as I'm in my head. So it's like you're not seeing beyond just what's close to you and not being creative, but being kind of stuck in your head. So myopia is nearsightedness. So here's the distinction that I want to move on to for hyperopia versus presbyopia. So presbyopia is when you are farsighted, but it's from old age, which is different from hyperopia. So presbyopia, if we break down the Greek terminology, is presbys plus op. So presbys means old man and the op means vision. So it's old man vision. And basically it means that you have decreased elasticity in the eyes as well as decreased accommodation. You're actually doing a lot of scanning following me on this handout because you are looking left and right to find where I wrote the next thing. Strabismus refers to being cross-eyed or wall-eyed. And this means that your eyes do not align or team together, and it has nothing to do with muscle weakness. Strabismus is often confused with lazy eye, which is amblyopia, and that has to do with the development of our vision in both eyes. So something happens where developmentally our vision doesn't develop correctly for amblyopia or lazy eye, but strabismus has to do with being cross-eyed. So it could be one eye that doesn't align or it could be both. And because of that, it could sometimes look like amblyopia. Now to the right, I'm gonna be covering the three different types of object perception. And I feel that all of these, even the ones that aren't categorized under object perception, all tie in together. And I feel like that's why these terms can be very confusing because they're all related. <laughs> so when you think object perception, it's really what it sounds like. How are we perceiving 
a certain object with her eyes. So the first one in this category is called visual closure. And when you think closure, it's exactly what you think does it close. So some people have difficulty recognizing if a shape is completely closed or not. So this is why I drew this circle and I didn't close the top and I drew different examples. So for testing this, there's actually handouts you can print out with various shapes that are completely closed or slightly open with a gap. And the person has to circle and identify which ones are, you know, fully closed or um, not. <laughs> so that's visual closure. And a lot of times when I'm working with children with handwriting, they don't close all their letters all the way or they'll draw a circle and they don't close all the way. So when you're using assessments as well, see, I know the, the bot too has a section for all of the fine motor components where they ask you like, did they close these objects when they drew it for like circle, triangle, everything. So that is part of their scoring system. The second type of object perception is form constancy. Form constancy is recognizing the same object from different angles. So as you can see, I drew a bunch of triangles around this word and we know when we look at these triangles that, oh, they're all triangles, even though they're pointing upside down to the side, different angles, you recognize that that is a triangle. If form, if form constancy if form constancy is challenging for you, then you would have a hard time recognizing that the upside down triangle is a triangle and you would only maybe recognize it when it's right side up. So think constant and the form never changes. So the form remains constant. It's just us having to perceive it from different angles. The third type of object perception is visual figure ground. And this one, as you can see, I kind of drew a bunch of little things. When you're opening a junk drawer and you're digging in there for your keys, you need to be able to figure out what is the key and, and ignore everything in the background. So the reason I drew the little squiggly line down to selective attention is that I find that these are very similar. Um, selective attention is required for you to understand and utilize visual figure ground because you have to focus on one object or one visual feature and you have to ignore the rest. You have to ignore the rest of the junk drawer to find that one key or to find that one rubber band. To give another example for a different sense, auditory figure ground would be when someone is able to pick out a specific sound or voice out of a very busy environment. So if you're eating with your friend at a restaurant and you are honing into just their voice and able to listen into what they're saying, you're able to ignore everything else like the music and other people talking and the waiters. So that would be auditory figure ground. Another term is visual discrimination. And I think this ties in very well with form constancy. Visual discrimination is interpreting features of objects to categorize, match, and recognize. So this is a pretty broad term because I feel like this is something that we really want to expose children to, like when they're toddlers. This is why we do shape puzzles and have kids interact with different 3D toys because when they feel and touch, they're able to categorize and match, recognize different shapes and textures. They realize, oh, a circle is round. It doesn't have corners but a triangle has three corners and that's what makes it a triangle. So this is how we're developing our visual discrimination skills and it starts at a really young age. And you need to have that in order to understand visual closure, form constancy, and even visual figure ground. So it's a really important term to kind of tie in together a lot of the things that we do with object perception. Moving on, we're just going to cover some red flags. On the There are a lot of different red flags and these are some basic ones and I can kind of dive into a few more for peds specifically but misaligned eyes so that would be possibly lazy eye or some kind of eye weakness muscle weakness and delays in like tracking or scanning like if you were to move a little you know pencil or toy across someone's vision from left to right or up or down and their eyes can't follow that then that could be a sign that they're having difficulty with vision or ocular motor function. 
um, film or like opaque eyes. That's something we would want to look into or refer out to accordingly. Uh, same thing for like very large or very small pupils, like one or the other. And the things that I look for when I'm working with children are like things like frequent eye rubbing. If they're looking at work, uh, some kind of activity worksheet with me or a puzzle and they're tilting their head a lot, that's usually a sign, especially if they can't perceive a shape. This ties in with form constancy. If they're like having to turn their head all the way and have their ear touch their shoulder in order to see if this is the same shape, then um, that's some difficulty with visual perception, object perception. And I also just look at overall like safety, body awareness, as well as like clums clumsy behavior and ask the parents um, how that is at home or if they see any of that. Kids who have um, visual difficulties also tend to have eyes that fatigue very easily because they're working extra hard to try to make it all work. It's like they don't have the underlying foundational skill sets to do what the activity is asking them to do. So they get very tired easily, their eyes, and they'll lean on the table and prop their head on their elbow and things like that in order to try to just keep themselves going. So that concludes our video for today. I will also try to make a video on ocular motor function as it is closely related and I just really enjoy that topic. So I'll get that going as soon as I can. I hope you guys enjoy this video and I will see you guys next time. Thanks and take care.